it was me, my girlfriend, and my daughter. And, you know, we figured we had enough, spent enough time in, in Venice Beach. You know, we were there like two years. And I think we were like, okay, you know, it's time to go to the next place. I said, well, let's try to go to Hawaii. Well, we managed to get to Hilo, Hilo, Hawaii. And um, it was really nice, man. You know, we spent a couple weeks at my buddy's house. It was just really amazing. Um, you know, Hawaii was very beautiful. Went to waterfalls, went to climb trees, do all kinds of Went and walked through the woods, you know, all the fruit, the guavas, and mangoes, and sugar cane, bananas, and things that was just growing there on the island. Coconuts, lots of coconuts. You know, one thing led to another. My girlfriend had to leave. Uh, she was from South Africa, so she went back home to South Africa. And I was, you know, in Hawaii with my daughter. And we ended up caretaking for somebody's land. They had a little plot of land and a little house on this land. Man, it was just really far out. Like, we are living in the, in, in the bush. No running water. Uh, one little solar panel to run you know, a radio and a light bulb. We were there for like three months, a little over three months. And there was a beach that was maybe, you know, not five miles away, really, you know, about five miles away. You had to like walk down a cliff to get to the beach. Like, it was like a trail that went down this cliff. Black sand beach, coconut trees on the, growing on the beach. and. High up in the cliffs were like bees, like honeybees with these giant nests and shit. It was amazing. It was absolutely, it was actually quite magical. Every Sunday, I believe, they had drum circles on this beach. So all the hippies would show up and playing drums. And there was a hollow log there that you could play with sticks. There was like a, a tidal pool that was kind of dug out for the kids to be able to hang out with because the waves were incredible at this point. The beach is called Kehenna Beach, which I was told it means Hell's Beach in Hawaii. <laughs> because the undertow was so strong, man, it would just grab you and pull you right out to sea, you know? And you didn't have to walk but one, two, three steps, and then boom, you know, this barrel wave would crash you and pull you out to sea. And it was, that was crazy. Once you were out over the breaker, it was like, I don't know how deep it was, but it was just deep. You just float. I couldn't see bottom. It was just water, water, water all the way down. As a matter of fact, it was so deep. One day, I'm burning a spliff with some friends of mine on the beach. You know, this was during the week, so there's nobody really there. And a humpback whale just broke up out of the water. And splashed. I was just sitting there like, let his tail come up. Oosh. Everybody, ooh, we're cheering, you know, the four or five people that were on the beach, and just, this whale, hey, it's like a building rising out of the ocean, like a whale, it's hard to imagine how big a whale is actually, they also have these dolphins, they used to jump up out of the water and spin, they just call them spinner dolphins, okay, when people would see the pods of dolphins, they'd be like, dolphins, and they'd just run out on their little float boards or boogie boards or whatever, and swim out, I didn't have a job. I couldn't get a job. Tattooing in Venice or I mean in uh, Hawaii was very hard. They had you know a lot of licensing and paperwork and stuff like that, which I had done for Hawaii. I couldn't get on any kind of public assistance, so I didn't have like food stamps. You know, and so I, you know, with my daughter, it was kind of hard just to keep the pantry full. You know, basically run around tattooing for food. <laughs> You know, people would literally bring me groceries and I would tattoo them. They would use their food stamps to buy bags of groceries from the natural food store. And I would tattoo them. And they'd bring me bunches of bananas, coconuts. <laughs> coconuts, guavas, uh, bananas, you know, the things that you can find everywhere. Um, passion fruit, you know, they call them lilikoi. Right. Yeah, every morning for breakfast, when I mean, we trying to get my daughter to the school bus because she was enrolled in school there. And, you know, if we were running late and couldn't make like cereal or something for breakfast, we would just pick a bunch of fruit from the trees. Because <laughs> the 
school was like a town of Pahoa, which was um, maybe five miles in the other direction. You know, it was like five miles to the beach, five miles to town, and a mile maybe to that spot, or a half a mile to get to that spot on the road where you go to the beach or school. I had to do a lot of hitchhiking, even though I had a car. So a buddy of mine, I, I met this guy, I tattooed his arm, and um, he gave me a, an old uh, Subaru or Suzuki station wagon. <laughs> but it, the problem with this car was I didn't have no paperwork on it, and I had to start it with a, a, a knife <laughs> in the ignition. It was like no key, you know, it was very stolen looking. You know, he promised it wasn't a stolen car. But it's just ain't no keys, and we had to use a butter knife to start the car with. And um, no paperwork, you know, fictitious tags, blah, blah, blah. It's a whole mess. So eventually I abandoned the car. <clears throat> One day it broke down on me. <laughs> I took my daughter to go see King Kong the movie. And uh, it was the remake movie with Jack Black. And uh, we drove this car into Hilo, right? Big town. It was like 30 miles away, 35 miles away. And while we were there, man, just as we got up to the movie theater, the car breaks down. I get out and look at this car, man. It's got like three flat tires and it wouldn't start. You know, I think somehow me sticking the knife in the ignition to start it was, was left in the start position, not just on, but and I burnt out the starter and I, I just I just really effed this car up, man. So we decided to leave it. It wasn't worth getting caught with, you know, and then me and my daughter would have to explain why we were with this car. We were told not to take it out of town, out of Pahoa. It's called a Pahoa, a Puna beater. <laughs> Get out of town and, and it stopped working. So now we go see this movie and and I'm like, all right, we got to get back home, man. We, we started hitchhiking. And, and, and literally, as soon as we walked out of the movie, it started raining, like a downpour of rain. And we're soaking wet and we're, and we're hitchhiking to our house. And literally, we stopped at a gas station to get out of a, a rain squall. It was pouring. So we jumped in into this garage. And uh, some lady was like, where are you guys going? You know, I'm trying to get to Puna. Oh, I live in Puna. Boom, she took us all the way home, 30 miles. <laughs> Smoke a spliff. And I never saw this lady again. My girlfriend, she was in Alexandra, South Africa. And um, I was like, you know, couldn't get ganja, it was hard. You know, weed was actually very difficult to find in Hawaii at this, at this time. A lot of people were addicted to meth because it was easier to, to make than it was to grow ganja. Since it was such a small island, you know, people smoked what you grew or they sold what they grew. And to grow it, you'd have to have like, you know, space up in the uh, hills or whatever. But the police were serious about this, man. They had helicopters searching for the ganja and shit like that. So a lot of ganja people got busted. You know, what ended up happening was some s smart college kid uh, figured out a way to make pure methamphetamine. And so what he did was, because uh, so many people were in jail for weed, he put out the uh, this, this meth recipe for free. And everybody started doing that because it was, you know, less risk to make it and they could make more money from it, I guess, than weed. And they called this stuff ice, Hawaiian blue ice. And it just it ruined so many Hawaiians because now they're like addicted to meth and they're up all night. Meth messes with your mind. So all these people, instead of being high on ganja and being mellow, are now tweaking, meth, meth tweakers, running around the forest, planting booby traps, and doing all kinds of other crazy shit. And another thing, because they used to import bananas from Mexico to grow in um, Hawaii and the trees, you know, they, they would bring the banana trees and stuff like that. So they would have these little Mexican coqui frogs attached on them. What ended up happening was um, they, because there was no snakes, no natural enemies, there's frogs everywhere now. A lot of these Hawaiians grew up never heard, hearing of, of frogs chirping, you know, these little coquille frogs, coquille, coquille, <laughs> like the little chirp that they do. And so now they're high on meth, they're up 24 hours a day, and they're listening, they're going mad from this croaking of this little frog. So we were living in the bush, and somehow my um, girlfriend was able to send me uh, a couple hundred grams of cheap Swazi weed, right? It's like some of the cheapest weed that you could find in South Africa 
for quantity. I just needed some quantity of some ganja to smoke. So she sent me this weed that got so dry by the time it got to me, uh, you know, and it was like, I took like over a month to get to the, to get to me and I didn't have an address. So I had to go to the post office to see if this package arrived <laughs> and I get the package and boom, it's, you know, just, just dry, crumbly weed with full of seeds, full of seeds, you know, and I, which I was like, all these seeds. But everybody that I talked to saw the seeds as a blessing. Oh, now we can grow this ganja here. You know, I have ganja from Africa grown in Hawaii. So I would give the ganja uh, seeds to a bunch of friends of mine. And the next thing you know, they're giving me Hawaiian weed, <laughs> trading me Hawaiian weed for African seeds, you know, the Swazi seeds. And they went all over, right? I mean, I had a jar of seeds. There's a lot of seeds in this uh, bag. I'm smoking this bush weed with everybody. They're loving it. Oh, this is so strong. This is great. It's from Africa. This is I'm like, okay. I like to smoke some of this Hawaiian weed. <laughs> so, after a while, uh, things started getting a little rough. I'm tattooing for ganja and mushrooms. Another thing, mushrooms were very popular there. A lot of people uh, eat these magic mushrooms. So I was tattooing and I would get these bags of magic mushrooms, right? But I couldn't trip all the time and I couldn't... Uh, sell the mushrooms to because everybody had them you know i go to the beach and try to sell them and everybody had mushrooms i'm, I'm stuck like wondering what, what i'm going to do the only tap to get water was by the beach so that's like five miles away which i had to hitchhike rides to get to the beach to fill up you know jugs of water for our house like i said food was an issue and so i heard that um the guru for the temple that I used to go to in uh, Venice Beach was coming to uh, Hawaii. They were having a week-long festival. You know, flashback when I was in uh, Venice Beach, I was I would go to the, the Iskan Temple on Wasika Ave in uh, Venice Boulevard uh, in, in um, California, in Los Angeles. That was a big, beautiful temple. You know. And, but it was far away, you know, still like five miles or so from where I was at in Venice Beach. But there was another temple on Rose Avenue that I heard about and I discovered it one day. And I said, hey, this is a Krishna temple. I said, I got to start going to the, checking out this Krishna temple. So I started going to this Krishna temple and that's where I was introduced to my Guru Maharaj, Maharaj, Bhaktivedanta Narayan Goswami Maharaj. Next thing you'll know, 